The next speaker is uh, David Garcia Fernandez from the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, the presentation will be on quantifying the robustness of light transport in photonic nanostructures. David. Thanks a lot, uh, Danny, uh, Daniel, uh, and thanks also for the, to, to the organizers, um, especially to, to Sergio. I'm gonna be uh, a little bit of the grumpy guy <coughs> in, this, in this session. Um, not, not really. Um, I want to discuss with you uh, what are the general limitations of topological photonics uh, in general, and in particular, I want to address this particular question. Um, if uh, topological photonics really protect light transport from disorder. Uh, if this is the case, uh, I am interested on, on, on how much. This, in my opinion, is a relevant question because in the last few uh, let's say two, three years, we have uh, experienced a rather intense experimental activity uh, characterizing different implementations of uh, topological uh, photonic waveguides. Uh, the main goal of all these experiments is to minimize the effect of disorder in, in nanophotonic structures and to minimize in particular the backscattering of, of the waveguide mode. <clears throat> In general, in, in nanophotonics, we have an issue uh, with disorder um, because all these uh, structures uh, have to be fabricated in a clean room. And this process always has, uh, obviously, a, a limited tolerance. No? Um, there is something more. Uh, the materials that we use in nanophotonics uh, have a rather ra a high refractive index. Uh, we, we use silicon. Uh, we use uh, 3 5 semiconductors like gallium arsenide. And that's very efficient because uh, it enables us to confine light in, in the nanostructure due to the refract high refractive index contrast between these materials and the surrounding air. But this high refractive index contrast also enhances the effect of disorder, uh, of imperfection. Um, so the, 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 the general motivation of topological photonics is actually tackle this issue and minimize this, this effect. We are, as, as Alberto said, inspired by, by topological insulators in solid state materials. We know that these materials have certain properties that are determined by their balance bands. And these properties uh, are invariant against perturbations. Uh, that's why we need topology, no? Uh, but actually, disorder is a small perturbation to the system. Disorder and imperfection, is a, it, it doesn't change the topology of the system, but it's just a small perturbation. So that's why. These materials uh, in solid state, but also in, in, in bosonics, in phononics, in photonics, triggered this, mass at this much attention, no? so, because they are a possible solution against disorder. So um, as Alberto mentioned, the analogy to photonics is immediate, because in photonics, we also have photonic insulators. We have this type of, of structures. In this case, we can imagine a slab of silicon where we create this triangular lattice of holes. And by doing this, we uh, fold the, the dispersion relation of the ele electromagnetic field uh, in a very similar way as uh, the electrons in solids. So we have photonic gaps, and, and then we can define a photonic valence bands, if you want, or conducting bands. No? So the question is if we can push this analogy a little bit more and implement topological insulators, photonic topological insulators. And also, as, as Alberto mentioned, this is, this is rather tricky because uh, when we need to, we need to uh, break uh, symmetries in the system, and, and that's particularly challenging, for example, if we, we need to break the time reversal symmetry. In that case, um, in the experiment of Soliatic, they uh, uh, introduce a magnetic material, and that in, in, in the nanophotonics uh, spectral range gives a lot of losses. Uh, Alberto mentioned and explained us uh, a beautiful alternative to, to break time reversal symmetry, but in general, this is tricky. You know? Also, if we want to implement quantum spin or valley hall effects, we don't have, uh, we don't have really uh, half integer spin. So we rely on using optical, degree, optical degrees of freedom, like the intensity, the phase, or the polarization uh, that we can use to build up, to mimic uh, orbital and spin degrees of freedom in solid state. And, and, and with these building blocks, we can construct analogies of these effects, like the valley hall effect. Now, um, we also understand that, as I mentioned, uh, we need to break symmetries in the system to induce these topological phase transitions. That's actually what is done in, in, in all these cases. 
Uh, here, uh, in these experiments, the time reverse symmetry is not break broken, is the spatial inversion symmetry. In particular, this is done by including two atoms, two photonic atoms in the unit cell with different sizes. It, ca it can be two, these two circular holes or these triangles. And this mimics what happens in, in a, for example, in a transition metal decalcogenide where two different atoms breaks the, the, the in inversion symmetry of the hexagonal lat lattice of graphene. That's, that's, that's what is uh, aimed in, in, in following this approach. That um, uh, changes the very, very phase in KK prime, and, and then we have a, a valley hole effect. Now, coming back to, to, to my question, uh, to my initial question, when we implement these analogies um, um, and, and, and robust transport is a claim, uh, the question is, well, how much, you know, how much is this topological wave guiding uh, effect uh, robust against disorder, <clears throat> and in particular, how much compared to conventional light transport, conventional photonic waveguides? Uh, to 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 understand uh, or to to reply to answer this question, I, I want to uh, explain you in a little bit of detail what we uh, know uh, from uh, conventional waveguides, from conventional photonic crystal waveguides. This is a, a paradigmatic example. Uh, and this uh, material has been, this, this system has been used for many years in nanophotonics. It's, um, it's a, a, a simple system. It's, it's a triangular lattice of holes uh, etched on a slab of high, of a high refractive index material, silicon or calcium arsenide. And then we leave out a row of holes, which is the waveguide. Uh, this is etched in, in a thin slab, in a sub-wavelength slab, um, and, and, and the high refractive index contrast uh, confines the light within, within the slab by total internal reflection. Now, um, when light propagates through these defects uh, with a given wave vector, it, it does it with, uh, with a given dispersion relation. So this is the dispersion relation of, of this particular system. It's, it's interesting to look at the details because this will allow us to understand what happens in a topological wave? I mean, this is frequency and this is wave vector. As the system is periodic, we can fold the dispersion relation within the first free run zone. Uh, this A here is the separation between the holes in this, in this case, the unit length. And here we have different colors. Now we have different modes. Uh, the interesting ones are these blue ones, the, the guided modes through the defects. And then we have these red ones, which are slab modes. These modes are not confined to the defects, but can. Uh, propagates uh, through the slab. And then we have uh, these gray modes, which can escape out of the structure. They frustrate the total internal reflection and they can escape out of the structure. They are lost because they couple to the far field. Uh, this is the basic uh, 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 physical picture of these systems. Now, if we have a careful look of these modes, we, we see that they are rather flat when they approach to the uh, brilliant uh, zone, to the boundary of the brilliant zone. And this is very interesting, no? Because around this frequency, if we calculate the derivative of this flat band, we know that that's the group velocity of, of this mode, of this mode, uh, that in, 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 in ideally it vanishes, no? A flat band gives, gives rise to what is, what is known as uh, slow lives. Slow light, which propagates very slowly, ideally with, with a vanishing group velocity, a standing wave. Uh, it's very interesting when we want to uh, uh, have a strong light matter interaction. A side effect or um, maybe a different perspective to see this effect is to, to see that the, that the slowdown factor, this group index, which tell us how slow this, this uh, mode is propagating with respect to the speed of light in vacuum, uh, is the inverse of the of the derivative that's that accounts for the density of optical states at that frequency so it ideally the diverges no for this flat band we can put we can place many many modes at a given frequency and this high density of optical states is, is great in, in paper because it, it 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 allows us to implement a very efficient light matter interaction interface now uh, let's imagine we put a quantum light emitter in, in the defect. Uh, the large amount of density of optical states around the emitter and uh, along the defect uh, enhances dramatically the, its decay rate. So we can extract photons very, very fast from this emitter as compared to if the emitter is placed or is emitting in vacuum. 
So in paper, on paper, this is wonderful, no? because it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. We can extract many photons from this quantum emitter and propagate these photons very far through the chip and do uh, whatever we want with this, this uh, interface, quantum information processing with photons, for example. Uh, we, we, we heard uh, the, the seminar by Peter Lovell and, 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 and in, in, in quantum photonics, uh, this is uh, uh, an interesting platform uh, to use. The problem, as I said, the challenge is that we, on paper, we design our system, we go to the clean room, and uh, this uh, is always affected by imperfection. It, it, it's very tiny because we have a very, very good fabrication process, but, but even the, this tiny roughness in the whole uh, shape uh, has a dramatic effect in this particular system. So uh, this is the block mode, which propagates through the perfect lattice, perfect uh, waveguide. When we include these tiny effects in the simulation, in a finite different time domain simulation, we see that we, we have a, a, a interference pattern. So we don't have a propagating mode, we have a, a, an interference pattern where these constructive interference spots are like cavity modes. This obviously is, is, is rather sad because it limits the uh, maximum achievable group index uh, value in these systems. Uh, and more than anything, uh, it prevents us from propagating photons from, from our quantum emitter far away into the chip. Now, um, uh, how can we um, probe this experimentally? So far, I have been showing simulations uh, to give you the physical picture, but, but we can probe this um, with a, a near field evanescent coupling uh, setup. So we have a fiber loop, we heat a fiber, optical fiber, and we create a loop, and we place it in, in close contact with the, with the waveguide. And then we shine a tunable laser on one of the sides and we measure the transmission. Now, if we close this waveguide, um, we create a cavity uh, in which these, all these tips are, uh, correspond to uh, cavity modes. So when light propagates through this fiber loop and meets, uh, 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 finds a cavity mode at a particular wavelength, it leaks into the waveguide. That's why we observe a, a dip here. And, and in reflection, we observe a peak. Now, if you, you observe carefully, we, the, the peaks are spectrally separated at a different uh, spectral distances. That's because the group index is actually uh, changing. Changing. We, we can extract the experimental group index from, from this type of experiment. Now, if we leave the, the waveguide open, we, we still see, in principle, we shouldn't have any cavity mode, but we still see these, these, these cavities, these, these peaks. These peaks correspond to these uh, constructive interference spots. And if we actually look carefully, uh, they, are, they are rather uh, uh, high quality. Uh, I don't know why I have this problem. They are rather high quality. Uh, so um, the, the, their line width is very, very uh, thin. To understand uh, this, uh, we have to look at a, an engineer cavity. Like typically we, we do cavities by creating defects, point defects in, in a lattice where we can find the electromagnetic field. So the, the, the spectrum line width of this uh, mode in, in the spectrum tells us this, this Q value tells us how long the photon uh, stays in the cavity before being lost. So actually these cavities are rather, rather good, uh, even if they are uh, induced by disorder. And as a side comment to, to topology, I want to say that we can exploit these, these, these cavities we can exploit complexity in our advantage. And this is what we did uh, in the last uh, years. Uh, we can use these cavities, for example, to talk to quantum light emitters and uh, it, it change dramatically their, their uh, decay rate. As you can see here, do cavity quantum electrodynamic experiments. We can also add gain to the system, to the waveguide, and, and, and create a multimode nanolayson. These experiments were done in the group of, of Peter Lobel uh, back in the Niels Bohr Institute, where I had the chance to work a few years. And, and very recently, we have used these cavity modes induced by disorder to talk to the mechanical vibrations of the system. So the, all these waveguides are vibrating in room, at room temperature. And uh, we can use these cavities to talk to these mechanical modes, to couple to these mechanical modes and do cavity optomechanics. <clears throat> this is obviously the completely opposite direction uh, as a topological photonic aims. No? Topological photonics aims to minimize the effect of disorder. Let's see uh, if that's the case and how much. Um, 
to uh, evaluate, to quantify the, the, the effect of the robustness, the, uh, the effect of disorder in a wave cut, we need to calculate or measure, measure the backscattering length. This, this length is a mean free path that tells us how long uh, a wave can propagate through the wave cut before being scattered back due to disorder in average. It's a mean free path. So we have to compare this uh, mean free path to the length of our wave cut. If our wave cut is longer than this mean free path, we are in trouble. Uh, we will have this strong uh, interference effect. And um, maybe we can use these cavities for, uh, for the experience I mentioned, but this is not really robust uh, transport. If our wave cut is shorter than the, than the mean free path, uh, we are in business. Uh, then the, 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 the transport is robust against disorder because in, in average, it doesn't scatter back uh, before the, uh, the being transmitted through the wave guide. A very important uh, thing to bear in mind, and that's why I explain a little bit in detail the, 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 the slow light effect in, wave, in conventional wave guides, is that we have to measure and calculate this mean free path with respect to the group index, to the density of optical states. In, in conventional wave guides, we know that the, they are strongly linked to each other. So the higher the density of, of optical states, the shorter this mean free path. And that's pretty sad because it turns out that actually is the slow light regime uh, the most sensitive, let's say, spectral feature in the system. No? So we have to be careful with this and look in, in photonic uh, topological wave cuts if this is really the case. No? Um, so coming back to the question, does topological photonics protect light transport from disorder? Well, let's let's have a look. Let's calculate the backscattering length in a valley hole wave cut and compare it to a conventional wave cut. We during the lockdown we couldn't make uh, any measurements, so uh, any experiments. So we 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 did uh, numerical experiments because we were really interested in in this question. So we designed a generic valley hole wave cut, topological wave cut, where we break the inversion symmetry uh, using two pillars with different sizes. This is a, a generic version of all the the the, the, the valley hole wave cuts that you can uh, find in the in the experiments in the last few years, and then we compare our topological wave cut with a conventional wave cut where we don't break the inversion symmetry. So the pillar silicon pillar on air is at the center of the unit cell. So here we have two uh, different wave guiding mechanisms. In one case, in the topological case, we have an interface between two crystals, two valley crystals with opposed symmetry we don't really have a defect. So it's the interface that is acting as the wave cut. In the conventional one, we, we, we need to take out a row of, pil of pillars and create a defect to guide the light. Now, using pillars uh, was very useful because it uh, allow us in a very easy, straightforward way to flatten the band in both cases, the, the edge modes and the conventional mode. And as I mentioned, this is crucial because when we measure or calculate the backscattering length, we need to know at which group index we are doing that. So uh, this flattening the band uh, uh, gives us a, a very large range of group index values. Um, how do we do the, the calculation? So uh, in principle, we perturb our systems in a controlled way. We move the pillars. We could do many different ways, many, many different things, but we move the pillars according to a normal distribution, which standard deviation uh, is our measure of disorder. Um, this standard deviation is, is, is calculated as a function of the distance uh, between the pillars, this A, this unit length. So this is a, a control way to, uh, to perturb our systems. No? We will do it in a, in a, in a, in a so we will have a, an, an increasing amount of disorder. Now, before calculating the backscattering length, we were interested in on what is how, how sensitive these systems are to disorder? Um, uh, when we perturb uh, the system, when we disorder, when, when, when we introduce disorder in the wave guide, ha, uh, the, 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 these modes shift a little bit in frequency. No? For each instance of disorder, they appear at a different, slightly different frequency. And if we repeat this many times, like 1,000 times, uh, there will be a, a spectral range where they appear. No? Um, we wanted to compare this. Uh, this is not a measure of the robustness of light transport. This is just a measure of how sensitive these this particular systems are. And it turned out after these so many uh, realizations that 
the topological wavecat is actually a little bit more sensitive than the than the conventional one. It, it shifted it shifted a little bit more than the conventional. Now we we really are coming back to the calculation. Um, uh, we place a, a, a dipole emitter at the edge of the wavecat, uh, and 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 we let emit at a given frequency, which is related to a particular group index. This is again why so it's important to to know to control the shape of our wavecat mode, because now we have access to a large value of the group index. Uh, and we can calculate for, uh, we, we have a correlation between frequency and group index. Also, it's also important that the remote is single mode, not otherwise, it's not straightforward. And then we calculate the, the electromagnetic field excited by this dipole emitter. Uh, we, we do this, uh, it's a finite element solution of the Maxwell equations, start uh, put in uh, boundary conditions, we can discuss it later, the details, but we repeat this for the conventional wave guides. We repeat it for um, different values of the group index, for the, the um, uh, different amounts of disorder. And the picture that we have is uh, is a little bit complex. Let me let me summarize uh, what we uh, what we learn. Um, before that, uh, the backscattering length uh, is is is. Uh, estimated from the average of this intensity uh, calculation. So uh, one has to repeat these calculations many, many times. It's really a, a, a um, computational heavy uh, experimental numerical experiment, numerical experiment, if you want. We have to repeat this uh, for many configurations of disorder, keeping the standard deviation of our, our normal distribution fixed. Uh, and then we repeat it, and then we average out, and from the average decay of the intensity, we extract the backscattering length. So the stiffer this decay, the stronger the backscattering. All right, this, this is important. It's, it's the inverse of this slope, the backscattering length. Um, we, as I say, we repeat it for many uh, uh, different parameters because we wanted to probe a little bit the phase space of this uh, transport. For a given amount of disorder, this is the picture, uh, uh, the backscattering length uh, of the valley and the conventional waveguides. It's true that for this amount of disorder, we see uh, less backscattering in the waveguide, in the topological waveguide, even for very large amounts of disorder, uh, of group in spaces. This is rather interesting because um, this backscattering is a few tens of microns, and that's great. No, we, we are going from a few microns in the in the in the conventional waveguides to uh, at least four times more. That's a step forward. Um, it's true that this particular calculation is for rather low variations, not really realistic. The, the, the typical variations, fluctuations in a conventional state-of-the-art fabrication process are like one, 1 1.5 nanometers. So it's, it's important to repeat this calculation for a, a different, uh, large, a larger amount of disorder. This is what we plot here. This is backscattering uh, versus disorder and for a fixed group index, a rather low group index. No? So here we see uh, something interesting. Um, this is log scale, by the way. Um, for large amount of disorder, around three nanometers fluctuations in average, the conventional waveguide behaves better, meaning it's more robust against disorder. For low amount of disorder, this is not the case. It's, it's the way around. But if we go to uh, large group indices, th this behavior is even more pronounced. For large amount of disorder, the, 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 the topological waveguide is really way worse, few orders of magnitude worse than the conventional one. For low amount of disorder, is the way around. For low, low amount of disorder, uh, the conventional wave, the topological waveguide has a very long backscattering length, and that's interesting because now we are in this on business. Now. What I want to to uh, to, to uh, let you understand is that um, in some cases for some uh, amounts of disorder, uh, or maybe combining uh, a better fabrication process with topological uh, waveguides, we, uh, we are maybe able to get very large group indices. And that's, that's uh, rather interesting. Um, 
just to 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 wrap up uh, um, this discussion. So, um, in general, we have an issue in nanophotonics with disorder. Sometimes disorder is just a perturbation; just it's just a slight uh, modification of the properties uh, of the photonic properties. But sometimes, like in the wave kites, in the slow lights wave kites, uh, it's really a uh, challenging. It really it really ruins uh, our system. Topology, topological photonics may be a solution uh, uh, in certain cases. Uh, in, in, in certain cases, we, um, depending on the design, we just focus here on a valley hall, but it, it may be some other analogies are more robust uh, against disorder, but we have to take into account different things. The first thing is the density of states, the group index. That's a very important parameter. Uh, being uh, transmitting light uh, uh, at low group index is not challenging. It is not challenging also for conventional wave gets. For that, we don't need any topological approach. It's only when we get to very high uh, group indices when we need solutions. And as I said, topology is, is maybe one of the solutions. Probably not the only one, but it's maybe one of the solutions. Um, I want to finish. Uh, um, um, explaining why slow light is relevant in general, and in, in particular in, at the nanoscale. Light, uh, as we know, propagates at extremely high speeds in vacuum, and in general, it, it, it interacts very weakly with matter. Uh, this is uh, very interesting, uh, sometimes because it allows us to observe very far in the universe, or uh, to transmit information through optical fibers to very long distances, but it is, it is a challenge when we need a strong light matter interaction. So uh, faster is not always better. Uh, topological slow lights uh, or, or uh, robust slow light uh, would be very interesting because it will be an enhanced light matter interaction, as I mentioned, but it, it will also be robust against disorder. And that's interesting, not only for quantum optics, uh, but for many other applications, for optical nonlinearities, for optical switching, pulse delay, optical gain or optical storage or a few more. In all these applications, the enhancement factor is the group index. So going from an NG of 100 to an NG of 1000, it will be a, a breakthrough, a, a, a really a different uh, business. So uh, that's, that's rather interesting for many, many applications in, in nanophotonics. I want to, to finish uh, with the acknowledgements uh, with the people that has been involved in, in these calculations and in this work. Um, I, I also want to thank in first, in first place uh, the Photonics and Photonic uh, Nanostructures Group. I have been working here for, I think, six years. Um, it has been a pleasure. Uh, it, it has been very exciting. I will be moving in the next months to, to Madrid to establish my own group. And, and I want to thank especially the group leader, Clias Tomayor, uh, because she has been extremely generous and she has established a very exciting uh, research group where it's very exciting to discuss uh, uh, different ideas and, and, and the coupling of phonons and photons in different energy ranges. I also want to thank in particular uh, the people uh, involved in, in, the, in these particular calculations, uh, Guillermo and Jordi, and uh, I want to finish with the, with the, with the funding, uh, acknowledging the funding uh, 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 agencies. No? Uh, this work is, uh, is, has been done in the, in the, in, within the TOCHA Fed Proactive uh, projects, which is uh, uh, organizing this conference. The idea behind this, this project is to bring, up, bring uh, concepts from topological insulators in solid state physics to bosonics, to phononics and photonics. And in, in that translation uh, is relevant to, to, uh, to understand under what, what circumstances this translation is, is, um, is valid. Um, and finally, I, I want to thank the, the Spanish government because they funded me the tenure track that I have been working with the last few years. And, and that's, that's it. Thank you also to, for your attention. Thank you, David, very much. David, very much for this. Uh enlightening presentation. Uh, the panel is open for, for questions. You can type your questions in the questions and answers box at the bottom of the screen, or you can raise your hand with a small logo icon, raise hand. So we have Alberto, let me check if I 
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, David. Uh, very, very nice presentation. I have a question about, you consider uh, basically this uh, round, these holes, these round holes, uh, the photonic crystals made out of round holes. You showed in the introduction and, and uh, in some of your slides that there is a traditionally another way also of doing this uh, hole, hole, valley hole crystals, which is with triangles. Yeah. So do you, do, is there, have you uh, explored the, the differences between the two configurations? Is yeah. one more robust than the other or they are equivalent? Uh, that, that, that's actually very interesting. Also, the question is actually, um, if different designs or different implementations of the, of a, um, a given analogy like valley hole would give rise to different backscattering lens. So the reason why we focus on, on, on round pillars is because it was easy. We tried actually with a slab with, tri with triangle holes to mimic the, the experiment, but it, then it's challenging to flat the, the dispersion relation. We're, we are working on that, but you need to implement optimization algorithms, and that's computing very, 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 very uh, challenging. Uh, we didn't try it. We didn't try it to change the, the shape of the thing. I, 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 but I, I, I don't really know if it, that's matters, not that matters because I, in, in my opinion, what really matters is the group index and, uh, and then, I don't know actually, if a different feature size would give you a more robust a valley, uh, minimizing the intervalley scattering, I, I don't know, we didn't try. We didn't try. So if I understand correctly, sorry for the follow-up, is that to get a slow light, the, the holes is much better, right? The, the, the pillars on air, these calculations were pillars on air. This is not a realistic uh, uh, some, uh, structure, uh, as we know, but pillars on air are a very easy way to flatten the dispersion relation. If you go to a slab, silicon slab, with holes, with circular holes or with triangles, that's challenging to flatten, to flatten the, the edge state. We are working on that. Uh, but for that, you need to take the, the edge state and, uh, and, and, and do a, a band engineering. And to do that, um, in, three, in a fully 3D calculation is, is computing, computationally uh, heavy. Uh, it's, it's not a straightforward. So, um, so, so that's, the, that's the reason why we used pillars on air for the calculation. Hmm. So are there any other question in the, in the room? I have a, uh, one question. Uh, Daniel. Yeah. yeah, please. Uh, David, thank you for, for this very instructive and, and didactical presentation. Um, for the last part, uh, you, you were discussing uh, um, what is the transmission uh, as a function of disorder for for a trivial and topological mm -hmm. valley uh, uh, wave guides? Mm -hmm. And then you see this transition. Uh, these are that in which uh, you you go in which the topological, uh, the trivial or the trivial uh, wave guide has a, a lower transmission, and then it goes to large transmission uh, mm -hmm. for high disorder. Yeah. Uh, these are numerical results, right? Yeah. Uh, so do you, do you have an intuition of why this uh, crossover occurs? Not really, actually. Um, but it seems that uh, well, something something that we can observe here is that if you see the conventional waveguide is much more sensitive to the to 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 a different to a larger group index. No? Here you you see how you have a, a stiff backscattering length, which is very dependent on disorder, and that that dependence is really flattened. So at some point, the group, the conventional wave cut, it's really ruined. The, the valley hole is much more sensitive and keeps that sensitivity uh, for larger group indices. Maybe, I think that maybe it, it, the, the valley hole effect is actually uh, working, is working for low amount of disorder. So it prevents uh, the backscattering of, 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 it introduces some kind of chirality uh, in between the forward and the backscatter uh, wave guide <clears throat> modes. But that, um, that, that uh, chirality is lost at a given point, as we see here. Uh, uh, and in that case, uh, the, the wave guide becomes uh, worst 
than the conventional one. So there, this, this, this calculation show that there is some kind of protection, actually, some kind of protection, but that protection is lost uh, for a given, uh, for, for large uh, disorder. But, but yeah, we, we don't really know why it becomes really worse. You, can, you, you could imagine, may, maybe, it's, maybe it's because uh, how the, the, the edge mode is implemented. It's, it's an interface mode. Maybe um, uh, the fact that you have here holes, I don't know, uh, may, maybe that it's a larger source of, of scattering than uh, just a pure defects uh, with, with uh, small perturbations. So have you, have you looked at, at the, at the um, um, the position of the crossover with the group index, it seems that it occurs yeah. at the same place or similar Yeah, place. it occurs at that, what we call, we call it a critical a degree of, of critical disorder. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's around one, 1 1.5 nanometers if you consider 500 nanometers uh, space okay. in between the holes. Uh, that's, we, if we, we repeated this for different group indices and that is somehow fixed, maybe, this disorder is uh, is determined by the particular implementation of the valley hall effects. Maybe we change the shapes of the of the triangle. For example, the, the, we go for to triangles or different things, different features. That that crossover will change. Yeah, probably. And, and that's, that's interesting actually because if we push this uh, this crossover to larger group in the uh, larger uh, disorder. Then, then, then that 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 that's uh, that's good. That that would be great. Uh, that's perfect. Thanks, David. I think I, there are more more questions. I really so, Clivia, you have the microphone. Okay. Um, well, thank you, David. I I would also suggest that intuitively we have the uh, links scales associated with this disorder, also of a fairly local uh, situation in terms of unit cells. And we still do not know how much the variation of the wave functions will be distorted in that length scale comparable, commensurable to the unit cell. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a, quite a challenging work ahead to, to see mm -hmm. and compare with our simulations, mm -hmm. uh, particularly to, to ascertain and test whether the lattice of holes versus the lattice of triangles or otherwise uh, would help to clarify that, whether it's a, a local type of issue, yeah. which is repeated, of course, and consequently amplified, mm -hmm. or, or whether it is a, a different reason. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thank you for the talk. That was very instructive. Thank you. Uh, totally right. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, actually also Alberto mentioned, we have a phase space here in these implementations of topological photonics. and. As you mentioned, also there, there may be some engineering in the unit cell. Now, these the, these calculations are heavy computationally. Um, uh, so the tools uh, that we propose are not straightforward to use in any design that you 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 make. We are working on a much lighter way to calculate these things, introducing guided mode expansions and block mode expansions that will allow us to calculate back, a backscattering length of a three D wave cut in a much shorter uh, time. And I think that will be interesting. If you come up with a new idea, with a new design, before going to the fabrication, I would, I, I would think that it's, it's better to calculate the backscattering length and say, well, listen, for a relatively realistic amount of disorder, this is, this is working, let's go for it. I think it's, if we, if we can implement these uh, approximations and, and, and lighter computational uh, tools, uh, that would be uh, useful for the community, I think. So David, maybe it, uh, it can be related to the kind of disorders that you are putting in the unit cells, right? Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the kind of disorder, you will alter or not the topological invariance of each one of the unit cells. That's same. That's that's an uh, an interesting question. We we when we were doing this, the 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 calculations, we we thought maybe we, if we make the pillars larger and smaller, but with a fixed position, that would be different. Maybe there are uh, types of disorder that can uh, uh, preserve the the, um, the 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 valley hall effect in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, uh, perturb uh, the size of the pillars, and we didn't see a, 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 a large uh, difference here. Um, and in general, I would say. That would be a, an interesting academic exercise. But I mean, when you go to the clean room, you don't have perfect 
holes. Totally, totally, totally. So, uh, but, but also something relevant is that when you go to the clean room, you have roughness, position, shape, and all these things. But, but the effect is as you could, you could make a statistical analysis and say, well, the, the effect is as if I had perfect holes moved, no? Because uh, this back scattering is a mean free path. So uh, what, what is relevant here is to do a statistical analysis. Um, but yeah, that's, that's maybe, it's maybe interesting. So far, we didn't see any effects. Maybe uh, for different feature sizes or shapes, maybe that's, that's, that's different, yeah. Okay. If there is not any urgent question for the full panel, we can thank you again, David, and thank also Alberto for these magnificent talks.